Because uh, one of the issues, this is a community with a lot of uh, retired people. And one of the issues for retired people is having some view of a life that has some kind of direction and purpose. Yeah. And uh, a wonderful way to get that, as we both know, is to find ways to give of yourself. Well, we have plenty to give with our backgrounds. Yes, yes, we do. You know, and so that's the special thing. That Anybody uh, who spends more than a little time in our Nachula gets so much blessing. I mean, it's just inconceivable. It's like, it's like having a great fortune. Yes, yes. Now, you and I both... Uh, will have missed one era natural uh, opportunity uh as i was leaving one of the siders that i knew uh was saying it was unfortunate i was leaving so soon because if you stay there 12 years one orbit of jupiter then uh era natural uh, changes you forever so i only got half an orbit <laughs> About the same as me. I've been here five years, almost to the day. Yes. But there's no loss or diminution, as it says in Bhagavad Gita. Any effort on this path is beneficial and gives eternal results. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you just need to keep making the effort is what I've found. Mm -hmm. It never ends. Uh huh. It, well, it it just unfolds more and more and uh -huh. becomes more and more beautiful. Uh huh. I keep thinking, oh, this must be it. This this has got to be like the ultimate. It couldn't <laughs> be anything better than this. And then there is. <laughs> that's wonderful. You know, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, your voice will be an important voice now because I think that's a critical message. Well, one of the things I've found by experience is that my karma is like diametrically opposite to the masses. Uh-huh. So like back in the 70s and 80s and 90s when everybody was doing great, I was like oppressed. Uh-huh. But then after turn of the century, I started and I retired. Huh? I started doing really well. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, I didn't have a lot of money, but I had a lot of influence. I had a lot of friends. I traveled extensively, somehow or other, wound up in India again. And now with this pandemic, I got like two years of straight sodomy here in Arunachala. Mm -hmm. That's so very that good. was one of the greatest blessings ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, I think you know we're certainly uh, headed into a period of economic stress and maybe even a period of war, looking mm -hmm. at the astrology. And it's like everything is turning up roses for me. It's you know, it's nothing I'm doing. Right. It's just, I, it's just nature, I, you know. I certainly understand what you're saying too. Uh, you know, it's not something you're doing. I like your expression unfolding, because that describes it and you don't know what uh you're going to be given next does the rose know when it's blooming <laughs> yes 
And you saw it now with Zoom. One of the things you can do is you can download some little thing that lets you put in a virtual background. Ah. And so I'm using some photograph I took in at Raman Ashram in the old hall. And it's this is my favorite backdrop to use when I'm doing meditation thing, because this was one of my favorite meditation places. Yes. The, it's a uh, very powerful place to meditate. Yes. This is a place, the first time I walked into it, uh, I had no idea this was going to happen, but I just fell on the floor crying. Oh. Well, and, Ramana's influence is very strong. Uh huh. I came into contact with him five years ago in Mahabalipuram, uh huh, which is not too far away from right. Chennai. Right. I had, I was having trouble finding good association, mm -hmm. and uh, I heard of an astrologer there who had been, you know, his family had been in astrology for generations. And so I went to see him. And, oh, he turned out to be the best astrologer I've ever visited. Really great guy and deep insight. He's the first astrologer that ever totally got who I am without wow. me saying a word. <laughs> wow. And he recommended you should go to Raman, to um Tiruvannamalai. Uh -huh. It's a fireplace. It's a mountain place. It's a tirtha, a place of pilgrimage. And it's a very powerful place to do sadhana. Mm -hmm. So I was saying, it's really hard to do my sadhana here. <laughs> I don't know if you know, Mah Mahabalipuram is like a, a weekend party right. place. Right. In and right. so the vibes are some sometimes really awful, you know. <laughs> But here, even when there's some disturbance, you know, like around Diwali and people mm -hmm. are setting off crackers and stuff, even here, it's very easy to concentrate, very mm -hmm. easy to get lost in meditation. Mm -hmm. And then there are uh, some places there that I feel are pretty special. One of the places that I thing that I really enjoyed is uh, going up to Skanton Ashram uh, in the morning when it first opens, then uh, the Swami, when he opens it, uh, sits in the interior cave and does his own unique chant every morning. And you can just hear the love coming out of his voice. And it's just so beautiful. So my unfortunately, wife I, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, Skandashram has been closed. Oh, shit. Yeah. Nobody can go in. Okay. The last year and a half or so. Okay. Okay. But, you know, the energy is still there. Right. Of course. Of course, yeah. I just liked listening to the guy because his singing uh, mm. set a, a wonderful kind of atmosphere for meditating afterwards. And uh, the meditation there was uh, always good. And you know how it is with meditation. There's a there is a thing where you're if you're intent is higher then often the meditation is better and having mm -hmm. enough intent to walk up the mountain and do all of this stuff is first thing uh, in the morning too. <laughs> yeah it's good for you so don't we all want love you know and and really the only pure love is the ananya bhakti, the, the love between the soul, the individual, and the self. Mm -hmm. You know, that love has no beginning or end. Mm -hmm. And it's pure. It can never be covered over by anything else. Mm -hmm. It's always there, yes. even below the 
surface right. at the root of everything. Yes. Is that the key to bhakti? I think so. Yeah. That, that makes like, sense. Uh, the, like the Upanishad says, the, the wife is not dear on account of the wife. The wife is dear on account of the self. Yes. And the same with the husband, the sons, and everything else. Huh? Uh -huh. It's because we see some tiny reflection of the self in these so-called others that they seem attractive to us. Uh -huh. Otherwise, if we realize their illusory nature, you know, a jatta, that, that they were never born, they, they don't really exist even, they're just an appearance, a temporary one at that. How could we fall in love with that? Mm -hmm. So that reflection of the real self is the attractive nature in everything, the beauty in everything. Yes. And can be seen in everything if we look deep enough. If you just relax and get your own crap out of the way. <laughs> Now, one thing. He's always willing to bless us. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Rich. Now, one of the things that uh, was helpful to me while I was at Aeronatula, I spent uh, a lot of time in the forests on the west side of the mountains mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of time on the inner path and stuff like this. And I asked uh, my teacher, Nomi, how to get the best use of this walking time by Era Natula. And he says, just pay attention to what does not move. That's good advice. Yes, I think that's wonderful advice. Well, let me explain a little bit for our audience that consciousness is immovable. It's like a mirror. And the, and the whole world goes by and is reflected in it. But it never changes. Yes. Never goes anywhere. And so what does move? <laughs> Again, the self. One of the things that I uh, say repeatedly in the sessions is uh, what is it within you that has never changed? You find that and you found the self. Yes, yes. And it's funny, when I talk to people who have no spiritual experience and we start to explore what is within them, that has always been there. One of the things I ask them to do is go back to your oldest memory and look. And what do you see? And they tell me they see this same thing within them that they can notice now. Wow, that's fantastic. Because they have no preconceptions. They're looking. They're looking into it. Vichara, investigation. Yes. And I think uh, with uh, many of the people I've done this, this was their first case of this investigation. You know, oh, they never wonderful. looked before. That's a wonderful approach. I think well, too many people want to know about spiritual things, but not really look into it directly. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's work. Yeah. That takes, you know, a lot of work. Well, it's work uh, because you have to get your mind to do something that it's not comfortable with, which is to get out of the way. And look within. Yes. The mind wants to look outside. Oh, yes. look at all those things, you know? Yes, yes. But uh, one of the things that 
about this looking outside. One experience I had here that uh, to me was very strong was uh, when I still had my little motorbike, I was driving down a uh, main road here and past a stoplight going past Walmart. And there was just uh, this powerful sense of the uh, problem for people, which was, you know, all of this stuff outside the that we see via the senses, there's all of this stuff that we think is real, but just keeps changing. Hmm. And there is uh, something that kind of seems ephemeral, you know, which is consciousness, which doesn't change. And that's interesting. You know, it's, uh, was powerful to, you know, kind of have that moment where this is something that, uh, you know, kind of welled up from inside of me. That's the best kind of knowledge. So they're literally seeing it backwards. Right, exactly. Exactly. It's the inverted so view that we... I'm sorry, like the scientists... Who, who declare that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain function. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Whereas actually it's the other way around. Without consciousness, there wouldn't be a brain. <laughs> right, right, right. Consciousness provides the light that illumines the brain. What's so hard about that? Well, it's because we've been conditioned to see things the other way. Yes, yes. That's 12 well, years of public schooling, you know? <laughs> and even before the public school, I think it starts, you know, this poor little baby is just trying to figure out what's going on. And it makes a series of assumptions about itself and the world. And never in his life does it challenge those assumptions. And our culture doesn't teach you to look at that. No, it's very carefully arranged to distract you from looking at it. <laughs> Clever, these materialists. Oh, that's right. That's right. I don't think we should trust them. <laughs> they are not, they're not acting in our best interest or even their own. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Anthropologists are now finding out that there were societies in human history that had no central government. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh, you know, individual leadership like a king or something like that. In the ancient past, especially amongst the, uh, what is that called? Anthropocene? I mean, anyway, early humans, hominids. Right, right. Apparently had no class structure. Yes. People got together and made decisions by consensus. Yes. I've seen this. I've seen this in American Indian tribes. Yes, I was going to say that that was one of the places that uh, you would find it. Yeah, if anywhere, if it's still in, alive anywhere today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I, I uh, visited a couple of communities right after I retired, and I was thinking of starting my own, to see uh, this kind of decision-making, you know, in, in action. And I got it, and I, I loved it, and I wanted it. I wanted to do something with it. But when I got a bunch of people together and we had an actual ashram situation, they could not do it. They were always, no, you decide. You decide. You're the guru. You know better than we are, you know. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was like, <laughs> trying to get them to, to take the reins, you know, in their own hands, as, at least as far as day-to-day -day management. They could not do it. The condition is so strong to defer to a leader. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, my feeling, even though now people are starting to come to me and even invite me to Europe and stuff, I don't want to start another an organization. Right. 
because it's inevitably going to roll down that same path. Right. I think that's real healthy. I think, uh, you know, we noticed Ramana did not appoint a successor. You know, and I think that speaks exactly to the issue that you have there. Uh, he still set up his relatives to be able to take care of Ramanashram. And I think overall, they have not done a bad job. It's one of the places in the world where you can go to and have your practice, and they're not trying to impose anything on you. I don't know. I, I don't have much a relationship with Ramanashram. Sure. Uh, I'm so burned out on groups and organizations that <laughs> sure. I, I'm almost paranoid, you know. I go and visit. Anyway, to, yeah, the ashram to me, it seems like they were uh, certainly good with me and what mainly they did with people. Again, uh, most ashrams have a program or something like that. While they have their daily schedule of puja and things, they really don't have a teaching program or any discipline that they ask you to follow uh so you have the chance to uh just follow your heart that's the best thing and so mm -hmm. i like that the other thing i liked is because they had uh respect for my teacher then when i went there they said oh i uh, We'll treat you like a friend. You can come and have meals there anytime. Usually they restrict meals to people who are staying at the ashram or staff. And uh, my wife and I could go there anytime. And we loved going and having uh, lunch, sitting with 100 or 200 people on the floor, eating from the banana leaves. It was such yeah, a Yeah, I miss that. Yeah, that's the one thing about ashram life that's really pleasant. <laughs> uh huh. And so it was a good experience, though, as I got older, getting up off the floor seemed to get harder. I wonder why that is. <laughs> <laughs> Gravity must be increasing. That's I, I think that's it. I knew there was some <laughs> kind of problem like that. <laughs> You also see the increase in gravity with your skin. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got skin hanging off here and there. <laughs> Must be the G-force. <laughs> this Go one ahead. is the my old iPad that uh -huh. I'm using now. I got a new one. Check this out. This is the new 12.9-inch iPad Pro. Wow. Oh, it's awesome. Oops. Very good. <laughs> I took that picture early one morning. Right. That's what and, I thought. Uh, it's got the M1 processor, and it's about two or three times faster than my old iPad Pro, which is only three years old. Uh, I use it for editing video. Mm -hmm. And it'll it'll export uh, 4K video at two or three times faster than the real time of the video. In mm -hmm. other words, if the video is 10 minutes, it'll export it in like three minutes. Wow. Wow. That's fast. That's yeah. good. And, you know, I still try, try to find ways with these Unitarians to uh, sneak uh, meditation and uh, meditation <laughs> training into what I say. And so uh, this time I'm going to be talking about interoception, which is uh, how your body, how you feel your body. It's the part of the nervous system that's not the central nervous system. It's the vagus nerve and uh, that goes to your body and your organs. And uh, oh, the limbic. Yeah, so the limbic system is a subset of it. And so uh, this is 
particularly important, I think, in uh, things like mindfulness meditation, because the trick in mm-hmm. mindfulness meditation is to uh, use uh, sensory experience, paying attention to the sensory experience to right. uh, shut down the default network in your mind so you finally get a little peace. We did a series not long ago on the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, okay. which is about exactly that. Uh-huh. Buddha, Buddha's instructions on how to attain mindfulness. Yes, yes. And the really funny thing is that it's completely different from the from what is known as mindfulness in the West. Uh huh. Of course. Because it's it's a totally about getting the mind out of the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, that seems like what mindfulness is. And mm-hmm. uh, again, so this is a uh, way into it without sounding uh, religious or Buddhist or any of those things. Since I am talking to the Unitarians, the Unitarians, while they're a church, they are the least kind of gaudy church that you'll find. <laughs> Godfulness. That's the new right. Word. And so uh, <laughs> I, I just continue to try to find different ways to reach them. And there are a few there that I've enrolled in different uh, things that I've tried to do teaching meditation. Good for you, Richard. Well, you're our, you're our, our uh, infiltrating. <laughs> infiltrating the, the Unitarians. <laughs> That's right. Well, uh, anyway, so we will see how this works. I've tried, as I say, with them, I've tried different things, and certainly I've gone there and spoken about Ramana and non-duality and stuff like this, and uh, the more non-dual I get, the more I see their eyes glaze over. <laughs> yeah. Well, It's not easy for the mind to grasp because the mind functions by duality. Right. Subject and object, you know. We did a series on that, too. Of course. There's a wonderful little scripture called Drig Drishya Viveka. Yes, yes. Familiar with it. Wonderful. Uh Ah. You know, one one of of Ramana's favorites, right? And for me, the uh, objective view of things was really the first big kind of, uh, I don't want to call it breakthrough, but the first real thing that opened up inquiry for me was I was able then through that process to see real clearly that I'm the knower, not the known. And when I understood that, then it's easy to extend that. No, I know the body, so I'm not the body. I know the senses, so I'm not the senses. I know the prana, so I'm not that either. Shit, I even know the mind and know this ego. So who am I? Neti, neti. (laughs) That's right. That's right. And what I found about nete nete is for me, just quickly doing it uh, doesn't have much impact. Uh, looking at looking at the details and taking it deep rather than just dismissing everything with a quick not this is what I've had to do to make it useful. I spent a year. Why is it not? How is it not this? Uh huh. Right. Yeah, so you, you have to look into it. Right. Yes. I spent a year yeah. once uh, looking to see if I'm really my body or not. Mm. And I don't That's think I am. The kind of work that it takes. Yes. Yes. Well, people are going to watch this and wonder what the heck we're talking about. We understand, you know, like I said the other night when we first chatted on Signal, it's like I can feel your energy like you're present in the room. 
Like there's no distance at all. It's really amazing. Yes. I have one or two other friends like that. They're they're siddhas, you know. They're they're self-realized, although they don't look like sadhus. But from their attitude, from their point of view, and the things they say, I can tell they got it. Mm -hmm. So when we talk, when we you know communicate back and forth, it's like. 90% of the conversation is subliminal. It doesn't need to be said, you know, directly, but it's all there, you know, kind of just under the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's so refreshing to be understood. You know, one of the big problems here, I don't know how much Tamil you know, but I know very little. Mm -hmm. you know? Vanakam and hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we tried to learn Tamil. We even had a tutor come to our house uh, every week and he would teach us something and we would go into town and try to use it. And if our accent was not exactly correct, it's like they wouldn't even know that we're trying to speak Tamil to them. <laughs> it is this kind of a blurry, slurred pronunciation, as if you're somewhat drunk. You know, and I can't get into it. And then the what? The alphabet has something like eighty characters. A bunch of uh, uh, a lot of characters, and I've heard Man. two different versions of the characters because there are a bunch of them that are old and not used very much. So, so but, I haven't made I have made zero progress in Tamil, which is a shame because I can tell there are many nice sadhus here, mm -hmm. but I we can't communicate. We right, can't I, have a relationship. I found uh, a few of them that had some English and was able to make some contact with them because of that. And one of my favorite guys, he had no English at all, but, you know, that doesn't prevent you from having a relationship. The one that I met, you know, my sannyas guru, mm -hmm. Jnana Shakti, Jnana Shakti Swami, he's passed away now, but he had pretty good English. At least, you know, before he got his into his final days. Uh, and we could communicate quite well. But it's funny. We never really had like a direct physical relationship. Our relationship was on the energy platform mm -hmm. from the beginning. Like when, when he gave me sannyas, he was staying in the, you know, the old sadhu's home on the Parikram path. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was staying there. Doctors were looking after him and all. And I, I said, how much longer are you going to be with us? He said, I don't know, not very long. So I said, please give me sannyas. And instantly, no, no thinking, nothing, just, just laid this really powerful energy on me. And I also reached toward his feet. You know, I, I bowed to him and reached toward his feet. There was no physical contact, but wow, the energy was flowing, crackling, uh -huh. you know. It was really amazing. And everybody around could feel it, too. Uh -huh. And then when he passed, I was just coming to visit him. I mean, I literally arrived just at his last breath. And I spent the whole day meditating, you know, with his body. And I have one, one siddhi that if I'm close to someone and they leave the body, I can stay in contact with them mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. So after he left his body and things kind of settled down a little bit, I went inside and I tried to find him. And he was just gone. Disappeared completely. Poof. So hmm. after we did, you know, some of the ceremonies and, 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 you know, prepared the body for creation and stuff like this, there was about a two or three hour period when nothing was happening. 
And I just sat there at his feet in deep meditation. And I finally tracked him down. And he's like a god. I mean, he's like so expansive. He's like pure energy, pure consciousness. And he's he's huge, you know. <laughs> that's why it was so hard to find him. Yes, he's yes, that's what so I was thinking. Diffused. Yes. Yeah. So yes. like a like a, a interstellar gas cloud or something, you know, just just very diffuse, mm -hmm. but ecstatic. Like totally ecstatic. He was just like <laughs> so happy to be out of the body. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. So now, uh, I'm looking forward to that transition. Uh huh. My mother uh, also had the same city that you have, and she worked with, she was a psychiatric social worker, and a part of her pro practice was uh, working with death. And what she would do that wasn't usual is she would work with them after they died because she said a lot of people are confused after that and yes. they need, uh, you know, support to get through that. So that's what she would do. Have and, you read Tibetan Book of the Dead? Uh, no, I haven't. I know about it and I'm familiar with the contents and stuff, but I haven't read it. He talks about that quite a bit, how when the being leaves the body, a lot of times they're really spun, you know, Right. They don't know which way to go or what to do. And uh, so the Tibetan rituals around death are to help them get yes, oriented yes. and, you know, go in the right direction towards a higher destination. That's good. That's That's uh, wonderful to have that. Now, the one thing as a mischievous child I would do with my mother is I would say this kind of therapy you're doing after they're dead is good, but how do you build them? <laughs> Your credit's no good anymore. <laughs> That's right. That didn't seem to be a problem. No, it's not. You know, I wish the world, I wish this money thing was not like holding the whole world hostage because there's so much more that I could do if I had the resources or if I was able to access the resources, you know, and uh, people understood the importance of this work. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much more that we could do in all these areas. Uh, but I'm not willing to be owned by an organization. Right, that's right. The, that's the problem. Well, I think I appreciate the problem. And I think that is to your credit. I'm not willing to be owned by an organization, but I'm willing to cooperate and we can play together nice. As long as we can play together nice, then it's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm willing to play the game. Uh huh. As long as it doesn't restrict my ability to do the work. Yes. 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 That's, now, what so I like my old, I'm sorry. In my old ashram, you know, we were following the Vaishnava path. I uh, I was like a senior disciple of Prabhupada, the founder of ISKCON, and we were using his books because they're perfectly pitched for beginners. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a beginner. <laughs> right. I've been around the block, you know, and seeing the other side of all the rules and regulations, which is the spontaneous side. And of course, many of the sadhus here in India are also on the spontaneous platform because right. they've right. been doing it since birth. It's right. in their blood. They don't have to read any books, they know what's happening. So, well, unfortunately, the group could not make that transition mm -hmm. from the rules and regs and organization and all of that to the spontaneous love and the unfolding <laughs> that comes along with it, because it can go in any direction. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily follow the script. Right. But they wanted a script. They wanted a step-by-step procedure. You know? Well, that's the mind coming into uh, play. You know, that's what the mind wants. And when the mind does not have that, it gets insecure. Woo. Now, the problem... Fear. Yes, the problem with the mind getting insecure, one of the things that I've been reading, I continue to uh, read and find out about things that they're finding through current brain science. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that is really interesting to me is they found in terms of uh, the brain's plasticity, the way that it will naturally rebuild itself every night when you sleep, is that to uh, kind of speed up these changes, a couple of things are useful. One of them is uh, stress even though you don't usually talk about stress in terms of context of meditation, when you have uh, the stress, then it releases a brain hormone, noradrenaline, which gives you energy and marks the brain cells that we're using to be updated that night. Then when you have focus after this stress, then that takes another brain chemical, acetylcholine, that it also marks those same cells. And so that night in your sleep, you will have a double whammy with uh, the brain plasticity and combining those two things together make the brain changes that happen in meditation happen much faster. Ah, I think learning has a lot to do with it, too. mm -hmm. I never stop learning. I'm always investigating new things. Right. Of course. Of course, the Mm -hmm. learning continues to build the brain. Uh, This is just a, I think of it as a trick to kind of maybe speed up the process. So I'm trying to figure out how to use stress in my own meditation to see if I can do it to deepen it. One of the things that I found for me is uh, going into meditation with beginner's mind where I don't know what's going on. For me, my mind really wants to know what is going on. And when I approach it like I don't know what's going on, uh, it increases the internal sense of stress. And what I suspect is, you know, I'm initiating this part of the brain hormone that helps speed the process along. When I talk... When I talk to my friends about using stress in meditation, they all laugh at me, of course. (laughs) Well, that's because most of us think of meditation as an escape from stress. Right, exactly. And so I kind of wonder, uh, you know, with the Zen Buddhists, with their straight back, when you go to Raman Ashram, you can always tell who has had that training from how they sit. And uh, I was wondering if the uh, Zen Buddhist posture, where you have to deal with a lot of physical discomfort, if that actually then activated this stress uh, hormones and actually helped the process. It's possible. Possible. All I know is that, man, it sure hurts after about 20 minutes. Oh. Oh, yes. I understand. But, you know, I had that experience in 1984 where I was just meditating, just sitting with no plan, no method, no model, no philosophy, sitting and watching. And after about six weeks of this, like 12 to 16 hours a day, 
I got the full Kundalini experience and full realization of Brahman. You know, I could see Brahman in the world and the world in Brahman. And it was just so ecstatically blissful. It's its first path, you know, stream entry. Yes. And I, all the symptoms. And I didn't do anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it sounded to me a little bit like you were uh, like the Buddha just sitting under that tree. It was in, a part, in an apartment in Seattle, but this, yeah, same principle. <laughs> well, place doesn't matter. No, it's the same thing everywhere. One of the things I really want you to be doing between now and April is continuing to have open question and answer things with the people who may be there. I know it will build interest in what you're doing. And as a just a standalone thing, uh, these dialogues are so valuable to people who are on the path. It's definitely the next step. <laughs> I had got to the point where I just could not do the, the lecture thing anymore. Because <laughs> it's a one-way street, right. you know? We need the exchange of energy. Yes. And so you can do it this way and doing it with Zoom, then you see what we have here. You're able to uh exchange it and being able to share the visuals as a part of that is still mm -hmm. uh so good thank you so much richard this has really been wonderful we have to do this more often yes yes now that we can do it once we can do it again <laughs> <laughs>